Thanks very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'll hand over to Barbara, um, Barbara Halls, to introduce Greg. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you, all of you men and women out there in the um, cloud, uh, to the West Papua and Women's Office, because today we're launching uh, a book, JFK versus Alan Dulles, written by Greg Poolgrain. First of all, I want to share with you three lies. The first lie is about Britain during World War II. And the government spread the lie that carrots were very good for your eyesight because it wanted to conceal that the reason why British bombers were doing better on bombing missions against the enemy is because they had radar. They were working with radar, but they used the lie about you. If you eat your carrots, you get better eyesight. The second lie I want to talk about is to do with the Australian government telling us that we must protect our borders from refugees and then locking them up. And this lie conceals the brutality of the Australian government's policy. Yes, we don't want people to vote, vote smugglers to exploit people, but basically we are being brutal. The third lie I want to share, which is very relevant to Greg Pilgrim's book, is the lie that fighting communism makes us free and that West Papua had to be handed over to Indonesia in order to stop the spread of communism. Now, at this point, I'm going to get us to focus on three men. The first, Dag Hammarskjöld, Secretary, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, realised that the world was pretty unbalanced and that the newly emerging colonial or those nations coming out of the colonies were needed in order to balance the, the power of the West. And he had a program for assisting uh, people emerging for, from colonialism. The second person I want to talk about is JFK. And he was of like mind with Dag Hammarskjöld because he knew that West Papua was an issue, a very, very um, special issue. And like Dag Hammarskjöld, the way to go was to give the West Papuans a choice about becoming a nation. Their nationhood was sacrificed. And this is what Reg Pulgrain is able to explain to us why it happened. It's Edison, Waromi has dwelt upon this issue and Greg Pilgrim has dug into the whole business that since 1936, the likes of Nelson Rockefeller have wanted to access the resources of West Papua. It's a shocking book to read. A little bit about Greg Pilgrim. I first read his work uh, in the age newspaper it was just before christmas just before the new year and he was talking about the infant mortality rate on the south coast of west papua it was 60 percent 60 percent of babies were dying between birth and one year and i found that a terrible thing to understand and i very happily hand you over to greg Pilgrim. All right, thank you. I'll just uh, connect here with the presentation that I've prepared, if I can. Uh, where are we? Um, um, So, thank you. Can you see that clearly? Cast a cold eye. Yep. Yes. Okay. So basically, I'm just going to introduce New, uh, Indonesia as a big place. So I've got a a map to show you what Indonesia was like transposed onto USA. That's Portland, Oregon, and Indonesia. The, the archipelago stretches right across with right across USA, that is with 
New Guinea, well, half of New Guinea, the other half is cut off from Jayapura down to Meraki, with New Guinea uh, extraneous to the United States of America. So from, from Sabang, which is where Portland is on that map, from Sabang to Meraki, as the crow flies, is 5,247 kilometers, so it's a very big place. But if you actually want to go down Sumatra, down Java, and from Java go to Papua, it's, it's actually 5,940 kilometers. It's, it's a huge archipelago, the biggest in the world. The a question we're looking at is, uh, Alan Dulles is interested in this huge archipelago. Uh, I calculated that it's actually almost one seventh of the equator, the east-west extent of the archipelago is one seventh of the equator, 13% of the circumference of the earth. It is huge. As in the island of New Guinea itself is the, is the largest tropical island in the world. So why was Alan Dulles interested in this, in this place? Uh, well, profit. The Indonesian economy now is 16th largest in the world, as I say, and it's it's on track to be in the top four in 2050. Uh, at the time when Dulles was interested, he was with Standard Oil or Rockefeller Oil Empire. It was the biggest uh, company in the world, but in the in the time that we're looking at, we're going back to the 1600s. The VOC was the biggest country in the world, the biggest company in the world. And that's a, a shot there of the, the headquarters to give an idea. What made them big? They were dealing in spice and things like nutmeg, which was actually traded, nutmeg was traded from Papua back long uh, at the, around the Roman times. Mace is also part of the inner shell of inner skin of nutmeg. It's the secret ingredient of Coca-Cola. <laughs> Cloves, important as well in preserving meat and such things like that. So that gave spice a value which was equivalent to gold in those days. 1600s, the VOC was the richest country in the world, richest company in the world. <laughs> value, 7.9 trillion was estimated. So I've shown you there how many big companies today piled together would, would be the equivalent of the VOC, yeah? like Amazon, Facebook, Apple, whatever, all put together 7.9 trillion. And that was the approximate value of the, of the Dutch East India company. It's a huge, huge company. The Dutch invented the modern banking system to, to create this colossus. This gives you an idea of the where the spice was coming from. You can see the map of Indonesia there, with with the spice islands down, uh, if it's marked. But that island there of Run Run was the last British. Well, it was the first British island of the what became the British Empire, and it was the last stronghold of the British. The the Dutch forced them out, and I just like to include the the note that. The Dutch uh, <clears throat> did a bit of an exchange for the island of Rune for Manhattan, which you may know that already. Yeah? So the, the uh, spice and Indonesia was an extremely rich place. The Dutch extended their hold over the archipelago over the next 300 years. And there's a pic picture there of them, sort of how that basically it was military power that and allow them or enable them to extend their colonial hold over the next 300 years until, until the mid 20th century. That's when the Japanese army, Imperial army invaded and it brought an end to Dutch colonial rule. The aim of the Japanese, I'd like to point out, the aim of the Japanese expansion south was to claim the island of New Guinea. It, they wanted to make it a new Japan. They wanted its natural resources. Southeast Asia and possibly China would have been the market for Japanese manufactured goods, but it was New Guinea they wanted for the natural resources. 
and uh, they'd sent out scientists before the war began to, over to New Guinea to uh, familiarize themselves with the occupants, the inhabitants of the country, which is quite an amazing step to take. So uh, <clears throat> Alan Dulles was uh, an employee of Rockefeller Oil, as I said, from the 1920s, and he could see the potential in the Indies. His focus on the untouched Netherlands, New Guinea, was roughly equivalent to what the Japanese wanted 20 years later. But Rockefeller had been trying to access Netherlands, New Guinea since World War I. And he finally, Alan Dulles was successful finally in 1935. He formed a company. Uh, he formed a company that was Dutch Indonesian company, 60% controlled by Rockefeller interests. And this was the company that located the gold that's changed the history of West Papua ever since. They found gold in 1936 in the highlands of New Guinea, the remote highlands, and it was the world's, they knew at the time it was the world's largest deposit, twice as big as the biggest at the time, largest primary deposit of gold. And then six months before the Japanese invasion in 1941, they found oil as well. It was the richest oil they'd ever found. So basically you're looking at a, a stretch of land which was extremely rich in natural resources. Indonesia won its independence, history intervened. Indonesia won its independence in 1949 from the Dutch, got rid of colonial control. But of course, we can see now why, precisely why the Dutch retained the western half of New Guinea, for various reasons put out, but essentially it was, it was rich. Only Alan Dulles and the Dutch political elite were aware of the gold and the oil, not the Dutch public, not even Indonesia. The amazing amount of natural resources was kept secret by Rockefeller interests and by the Dutch elite. Part of this elite was Brunst, who became foreign minister for 17 years. His job, when he first became in the early 50s, was to keep Netherlands New Guinea in Dutch hands. Indonesia received secret US assistance to launch a campaign against Dutch colonial rule. Foreign Minister Sunario from 1955 told me about this secret fund. Luntz, or Luntz, he was, when he was Secretary General of NATO, when I interviewed him, told me that he offered to share the gold mine with the Americans, the American uh, interests, the Rockefeller interests, that is. But the reply that he got was that they'd, they'd get it for themselves when the Dutch were gone, which was rather blunt. And, and that's exactly what they did. So uh, Alan Dulles uh, in the 1950s was director of central intelligence under President Eisenhower. That's when the Cold War was really getting into swing. Starting in 1955, Dulles began plotting to oust President Sukarno. That is, he was calling him a communist even then, when even Richard Nixon, who was vice president under Eisenhower, saw him as a nationalist. There were seven assassin assassination attempts on, on Sukarno. I thought I'd just tell you about one. Some of them were plane crashes, attempted plane crashes, bombs in cars. But the one we probably know best was the grenade attack at Chikini in Jakarta, the one where hand grenades were thrown in the school where Sukarno's children were attending, actually. Radical Muslims were blamed, incorrectly, a trick that President Suharto's intelligence chief, Ali Motoko, later used quite a lot. And more recently, for those who follow Indonesian history, Munir, Indonesian activist, he realized the same trick was used in the Bali bombing in 2002. I spoke with a person who was incorrectly blamed for planning the failed Chikini assassination. He was former intelligence chief, Sir Kifli Lubis. And I also spoke with a man who saved Sukarno's life. He saw the hand grenades thrown, 
One was coming close to Sukarno, so he pushed the president over, jumped on top to protect his body with his own body, and Sukarno survived. And so did, so did the, the officer. He survived okay, got an instant promotion and a good job for the rest of his life looking after army pensions. And I met him when he was still in, still working. There's a shot of the New Guinea Highlands showing you the snow and Rockefeller interests. Uh, they couldn't really gain, gain control or gain, gain access to the wealth of New Guinea until, until the right political moment, the right political climate. So to achieve that, Dulles adopted a strategy. And I, I call it Dulles Indonesia strategy. First of all, first of all, he had to get rid of the Dutch colonial power occupying Netherlands, New Guinea. Then he had to curb, there was the threat, Papuan independence put forward by Hammerschold. He had to get rid of Hammerschold. That's what I will explain later. Sukarno was then given control of West New Guinea in 1963, 1st of May 1963, but that's at the same time as giving Sukarno West New Guinea, they were planning the downfall of Sukarno, the ending of Sukarno. And that, that was partly done by a centralized army command in 58 and also the coup in, in 1965-66. So Dulles realized Sukarno would help first off the Indonesian people rather than foreign companies. So he began planning regime change to replace Sukarno with a military regime. Preparing for this in 1958, Dulles began a civil war in Indonesia, and we call it today the Outer Islands Rebellion or the PRRI. PRRI. The end result, thanks to Alan Dulles, was a strong centralized army headquarters in Jakarta, before, which before 1958, didn't have, Indonesia didn't have. A centralized army command under General Suharto was essential, first of all, to oust the Dutch, and then in 65, 66, to oust President Sukarno. So Dulles was really a Machiavellian master. He was planning ahead. Why? Because Indonesia was so absolutely rich with natural resources, and he was determined to get what formerly was the world's richest colony. Until World War II, New Guinea did not have much Dutch rule at all. It was up, up to World War II, it was only 5% of the territory was under colonial control. That is 95% up to World War II was Papuan. It was, <laughs> Netherlands New Guinea was actually a misnomer, right? If only 5% was controlled by the Dutch. People tend to forget that. And I often ask, how can the Japanese arrange to give control of that such a territory when only 5% was Dutch controlled? Huh? In the 50s, in the 50s, the, the more that the Dutch decided to colonize the Papuans in the 1950s, the louder became the Indonesian call for the Dutch to leave. Rockefeller interests did not want the Papuans to be given independence. Neither did Sukarno. He knew nothing about the goal, but his quest to out, oust the Dutch really was quietly being funded by Rockefeller interests. To unite his people, Sukarno turned up the dial on Indonesian nationalism. He focused on the anti-colonial struggle of ousting the Dutch from Netherlands to Guinea, hoping to generate more unity in the same way that the struggle for independence 45-49 had, had brought Indonesians together. Barbara mentioned some lies before, and there were two, two uh, particular lies I wanted to talk about. Um, that lie number one, where was it? The lie number one here was about the, the territory was impoverished, had no natural resources. And the, the second, second lie was that uh, the Papuans themselves uh, uh, were incapable of uh, forming a modern state. That had largely come about because of the disappearance of Michael Rockefeller. That was Michael Rockefeller, they said, was eaten on the beach with Sago, a bit like seen out of Robinson Crusoe. Right? But what really happened to Michael Rockefeller? So 
I must ask you to, to read the book and find out, but basically I can say, I did interview Rene Wassink, who was with the anthropologist who was with Michael Rockefeller when he disappeared. And on the 18th of November, 1961. And he told me really the story that uh, when I repeated that story to uh, General Nasution, he agreed. He actually agreed. He said, after investigating himself, this is General Nasution, head of the Indonesian army, after he investigated that story later on and found it was completely false. The whole cannibal story was incorrect, he said. Anyway, people still pursue that idea today because it makes good press, I think. So it also takes away a lot of, uh, yeah, well, in 1969, it took away a lot of uh, impact for Papuans to, in 62, 63, for, for their own, to have their own state. 17 uh, was about Sution. Sution was head of the army, right? He head of the Indonesian army. He was, I mean, what Eddie Waromi before mentioned uh, the Cold War and communism. Sution was the anti-communist pro-US head of the Indonesian army. In 60, just at the end of 1960, he went to Moscow to finalize a huge arms deal just before President Kennedy had been inaugurated. So. Kennedy on his first day in office had a very huge problem facing him because the Soviets were backing Indonesia in the quest to out the Dutch, in the quest to oust the Dutch. Yeah? He, Kennedy wanted Indonesia on side in the Cold War. He found out that Nasution, and I checked with Nasution and I checked with the US records, Nasution wrote a secret message to US Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. He said, even though he went to Moscow to get the weapons, he definitely was pro-US. So they knew the threat of communism in West Papua was false. It, it, it helped uh, our prime minister here to change his mind. Barwick and Menzies changed their mind when they, when they found that out as well. Um, Kennedy, Kennedy, a Cold War confrontation with Indonesia backed by Soviet weapons. So what did he do? He quietly asked UN Secretary General Dark Hamashal to help. Now he couldn't do this openly because it would anger the Soviets, it would make the Cold War worse if the UN, was sec UN Secretary General was working secretly with Kennedy. So it was kept fairly quiet. Dark Hamashal was introducing a new UN policy to deal with a large number of African colonies that were becoming independent. He was willing to provide a newly independent country with UN assistance for six years in the form of UN experts and various departments to construct for the independent country a, a viable economy. He was planning to introduce this plan, he called it OPEX, to the UN General Assembly in late 1961 in relation to Papua. That is, it meant that the Papuans would be granted independence at the end of 61. And take away that whole, whole Soviet, uh, uh, sovereignty dispute that had been going on since the early 50s. Huh? Without, so Papuans will be independent without Dutch strings attached. The anti-colonial cry, which was so loud in Indonesia and actually had support from the Afro-Asian countries as well, would be removed from the sovereignty dispute between Holland and Indonesia. So that's the importance of what Hammarskjöld and Kennedy were planning. The Papuans themselves, I'm, I, yeah, well, some did, some didn't. They realized they were sitting on a wonderful huge island, but they didn't realize they were sitting on gold and copper deposits that would have made them one of the richest countries in the world. Um, so Kennedy basically uh, brought in Hammarskjöld to avoid uh, conflict with the Soviet Union. Eh? to avoid a Cold War conflict, which was on his desk the first day when he arrived in the White House. Hammarskjöld was uh, keen to do that because it was exactly uh, what he was after. Um, it suited his OPEX plan. And the person who told me this was uh, George Ivan Smith, his, his deputy, his uh, assistant uh, adjutant anyway. George, George uh, was uh, an Australian and uh, I met him in uh, Stroud in England and uh, 
in our first meeting, it's interesting. He, he we went through we went through some history, and as I was leaving, we both discovered we both came. I had spent time in Brisbane, so he said, "Come back." And that's when I came back the second time. He explained more fully his his uh, understanding, his close friendship with Doug Hammershaw, and uh, he himself spent the rest of his life trying to solve the Hammershaw uh, mystery. Uh, assassination. Hamishal was killed in a plane crash in the Congo shortly before the UN General Assembly was to start in New York. Uh, and that was the tragedy. Had, had uh, UN Secretary General implemented OPEX, he would, have, uh, he would have angered the Soviet Union, but at the same time, he would have defused the whole Cold War tension that was being built up. So it would have, it would have worked. On the one hand, we had the Soviet Union backing Indonesia with ships and planes. And on the other, USA, we had the commitment to back the Netherlands because of the NATO alliance. And China too was, was keen to, to see the Dutch end their colonial rule. When Hamishal was killed in 61, there was no clear evidence at the time it was assassination. But since 1961, various documents have emerged showing Alan Dulles was involved in the assassination of, by plane crash. That book by Susan Williams in 2001 restarted this investigation. I've discussed the assassination with her and my conclusion is that, uh, I mean, there was another plane, Fuga Magistra, there was this and there was talk of another little smaller bomb. But my conclusion is that the during the plane that was left before it took that final fateful flight, it was left unattended for a few hours. And in that time, someone fiddled with the altimeters. And that's what confused the pilot being brought in. The plane that attacked the UN Secretary General's plane uh, brought a moment of confusion. And then looking at the altimeters, which had been adjusted, the plane crashed. And the first thing that happened was the altimeters were ripped out and sent back to America for checking. And who gave the approval that they, everything was working well was J. Edgar Hoover in charge of the FBI, who was a close friend of Alan Dulles. Now, official investigations over the last 60 years have not questioned at all this, this conclusion by J. Edgar Hoover about the altimeters. And I think that's where the reinvestigation should focus at this yeah, to, to find out the uh, what really happened. Dulles had a bad record in the Congo. Right? He had already been involved in the death of the first president of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. And this was brought out in 1970, not until 1975, by the US Senate investigation, Senate Church. He investigated the death of Lumumba and found Alan Dulles at the time was head of the CIA. He had primary responsibility for the death of Patrice Lumumba. And, and Susan Williams found out the same intelligence group in the Congo linked to the CIA involved in the death of Lumumba were also involved in the death of Hammarskjöld. So it's highly likely that with a bit of first, with further investigation, they will get to the, to the, to the answer. My book shows the motive of Alan Dulles in the elimination of the Secretary General had more to do with politics around the other side of the world. Not so much, well, with the Congo, there was plenty of opportunity for the Congo, but I'm just saying Dulles was in, wanted Hammarskjöld, and he said that, out of the way, eliminated for his own reason. He didn't explain why, but that's why I'm saying it was politics around the other side of the world. Had Hammarskjöld implemented OPEX with the Papuans, even though, Hammarskjöld didn't know, wasn't aware of the goal. He would have completely disrupted Alan Dulles' plans in the pipeline for regime change, which had begun back in 57, 58. Kennedy, with Hammarskjöld gone, Kennedy was forced to intervene in the sovereignty dispute between the Netherlands and Indonesia. And the result, as we all know, was uh, the, new, the New York Agreement, 1962. UN was supposed to maintain a presence in the territory until the Papuans voted on their own future at the end of the decade. 
However, I just wanted to tell you before finishing, some Dutchmen, however, really under UN auspices, wanted to assist the Papuans in any way they could, particularly the Dutchman by the name of Zilstra, who was head of the Dutch Geological Foundation. He wanted to explore the gold copper deposit on the Alpine region of Netherlands, New Guinea, the one first found in 1936. And he would have made world news, of course, when he assayed the gold there again and found it was 15 grams per tonne rather than two grams per tonne as Freeport continued year after year saying the concentration was when they first began production in 1972. 15 grams per tonne made, made the gold deposit twice as rich as the richest in South Africa at the time. So Zilstra was going to start work in 63. And even though the territory was no longer called Netherlands, New Guinea was Irian Barra. He returned to the Netherlands over Christmas with his wife and was run over by a large truck one night, returning home from a Christmas party with some fellow geologists. I spoke with the widow, his widow. She told me the truck ran clean over the car as she was sitting next to her husband driving, driving home. They were going across the Afslo Dyke, which in those days was quite a narrow road, but now it's, it's two lanes. It's interesting, but two American ladies, two sisters have contacted me reading my book. And they're so interested in the death of, of Zilstra that they've started an investigation themselves into the, into the death of that one man. So to end, I could say when you're dealing with gold, I think of this quality and quantity, one Freeport director told me there's 200 years of mining ahead for Freeport Indonesia. The funeral procession can be quite lengthy. So I'll end here and some other time perhaps talk about Kennedy's involvement, which two years after Hammarskjöld, only two years threatened to derail the Cold War ambitions of Alan Dulles. In, this is only, I should add, only 30 months after President Chicano triumphantly arrived into uh, Hollandia or, or, the new, or the new town then, the capital called Jaipur today. He arrived there in May the 1st, 1963. Only 30 months later, he was basically looking at the end of his reign. It was when Suharto took over control of the army on the 1st of October, 1965. So I'll end on that note. Thanks very much.